January 2nd, 1932. Inside the Greene County Jail and the adjoining sheriff's residential quarters, people waited and prayed. News had come in that Sheriff Marcel Hendricks and Deputy Sheriff Wiley Mashburn had been seriously shot, but nobody knew how badly. His wife, Maud, sat with their young daughter, Maxine, and their two sons, Glenn and Merle. Glenn and Merle wanted to go and join the fight, try to take down the young brothers who had shot their father, but their mother pled with them, please don't. Next door in the jail, jailer Frank Willie was pacing. He was cursing the fact that he had not been there with them. He had warned the sheriff when he heard he wanted to go to the young farm. Mr. Willie said, I told him that Harry Young would shoot him if he could. I told him not to go after him unless he was sure he could take him out of there. Then the report came in that other officers had been shot. Eleven had gone in and only two had gotten out unharmed. None had had a care in the world or a worry when they left for the raid. Wiley Mashburn left his new red Durant sitting right outside in the driveway. Tony Oliver had a word with the insurance man, Mr. Durr, as he was headed out the door. He needed to sign his life insurance papers. He brushed him off and said, I don't have time right now, I'll do it when I get back. Now he and five other men, including the sheriff, were dead. And it was all the work of two brothers, Harry and Jennings Young. This is part two of my series on the Young Brothers Massacre. I am Madam Morbid. I am your guide on any number of historical adventures. In episode one, we talked about the bad guys, the Young Brothers, their life growing up, their step into crime, and Harry's first murder. Today, we're gonna talk about the good guys. I'm gonna talk about the lives of each one, visit their graves. In the next episode, we'll talk about the massacre itself, and then we'll talk about the aftermath and the capture of the young boys. As I visit each grave, I will tell you the story of that person's life. We're going to start with Sheriff Marcel Hendricks. Marcel Hendricks is buried in East Lawn Cemetery, as are two of the other law enforcement officers who died in the Young Brothers Massacre. He was 45 years old and had been born somewhere between Ash Grove and Bodark. His father was Dan Hendricks. He was a well-known stockman. They were of the, quote, Old Tennessee Hendrixes. And one of the first group of settlers to settle in Greene County, Missouri. So they'd been there for generations. Being sheriff was his life's ambition. Before he became sheriff, he had no law enforcement experience at all. And he had been sheriff for about three years when this occurred. He was a Freemason and he was a lifelong member of the Baptist Church where his funeral was held and that church is still standing. He built himself as a family man. He had three children with his wife, Maud. The oldest one was Glenn, who was 15, and Merle and Maxine, and Maxine was only five. He had been sheriff since 1928 when he was elected in an absolute landslide. He would have lived in the building which adjoined the jail with his family and it sounds like he was just kind of a man's man you know in the one of the pictures he's got a big old chaw tobacco just kind of a normal guy just like everybody else now one of the problems with the way marcel Hendricks approached going to the young farmhouse is the fact that he was pretty good friends with the young family he had been good friends with their father, JD, and he truly believed the boys wouldn't hurt them, which was something he really should not have gone into this believing. Policing had not adapted to the new environment brought on by Prohibition and the Great Depression an increase in crime and an increase in the violence with which perpetrators were willing to use. And of course, he had no training. None of the police officers going into this had any training, which is a problem. I'm now in Hazelwood Cemetery to visit the most experienced officer present that day at the Young Farm. 
Tony Oliver had been in the police force since 1906 and he was the head of detectives and oversaw the work of seven detectives who worked underneath him. Tony Oliver had been married twice. His first wife, Ella, died in 1906. He had seven children. His second wife is buried beside him. This is Maud Ann Coles. She would live until 1957. He lost two children in infancy. So five children would have been living at the time of his death. His oldest daughter would have been about 28 years old. His children were Opal. Little Oliver died in infancy, maybe was born, still born, I don't know. Helen, William, John, Ray, and Faye. And little John was four when he died. He is described, and this is a quote here, by Stephen McLaughlin as, quote, he had served as patrolman and traffic officer on practically every beat in the city and in two years made 1,352 arrests for crimes and misdemeanors ranging from drunkenness to murder. He's tall, he was clean shaven, he was a fair boss. He would have had a lot of advice to share with the seven detectives who worked underneath him of things he had experienced in his 25 years in pretty much any law enforcement position that you could do as a police officer. He was 50 years old. He was quiet, but he could be firm when he needed to be. I imagine he was just so well respected. He was the man, basically, it sounds like, in the police department in the 1920s and the 1930s. He was extremely brave in the face of adversity and danger. Tony was involved in a 1928 siege in which a police officer was killed. The suspect was Dobb Adams. His wife had left him. It sounds like he was an abusive piece. She was hiding in Kansas City and he wanted to know where she was. He knocked on the door of Zella Sinclair, one of his wife's really good friends. He told her there was a friend there to see her if she would come with him. He had a taxi. The driver of that taxi was named Roy Wells. And as soon as she got in the car, he pulled a gun on her. With a gun to his back, he forced Roy to drive them. Shortly out of town, off of Grant Street, he got her out of the car and he started beating her and demanding she tell him where his wife was. She refuses. He forced Wells to go about 100 yards further up the road on foot. He said, turn your back and don't watch. But Wells did and he saw Adams attacking her, beating her up and carrying her off into the woods. He said at that point, he took off and went to get help. When the severe beatings still did not result in Zella telling him what he wanted to know, Adams took his gun and shot her in the back. The bullet severed her spine and left her paralyzed. The 24-year-old would linger for weeks before dying in August. Adams then flagged down a farmer and at gunpoint forced him to drive him to his mother-in-law's house. His mother-in-law's name was Sarah Whalen. She was 54 years old and was at home with her 16-year-old daughter, Edith McCrary. He barged into the house and again demanded to know where his wife was. They refuse. So he shoots her mother, chases her sister into a closet where he starts stabbing her, and then he heads off to a house on College Street where his cousin lives and hides out. Sarah Whalen was shot in the abdomen and lingered for a couple of days before succumbing to her injuries. Her daughter Edith eventually recovered. The police find out where he is. A big force of police officers assemble to go to the house and search for Adams. There are at least 14 of them. There's three detectives, including Tony Oliver and Frank Darmond. They talk to the cousin they ask if Dob Adams is there. He says no, but he lied because he was there. 
And as they're searching the house, as soon as they open the door to the room he's hiding in, he opens fire. Frank was in front, so he took direct hits and died. 11 officers behind Tony Oliver flee in terror. That's why this becomes so controversial. Tony takes this guy in on his own while all these other guys have fled. They all are under investigation for cowardice. Tony Oliver had been involved in a similar incident to what happened the day of the Young Brothers Massacre, but he wasn't in charge because the farm was several miles outside of Springfield, which meant Sheriff Hendricks would be in charge, not Tony Oliver. And though he would have had advice to give, none of the guys who took part in this that day would have had any training whatsoever in apprehending someone who was holed up in a siege in a house without people getting killed. They were kind of flying by the seat of their pants. There was no rule book. There was no guidance for how to do this. So there's no evidence that anything would have gone any differently if Tony Oliver had been in charge. We'll never know. He was the only one who would have in any way done this before. Wiley Mashburn is buried in East Lawn Cemetery, stone's throw away from Marcel Hendricks. He was born August 27th, 1883, the son of Eli Mashburn and Mary Jane Gillespie. Wiley Mashburn was raised in Stratford, Missouri, which is just a few miles northeast of Springfield. He had come to Springfield when he was about eight years old. Wiley was married. His wife's name was Maud, and they had gotten married June 23rd, 1904. They only had one child, a daughter, Irma Maggie, born in 1910. Interestingly, her gravestone says 1912, but she's in the 1910 census, so there's no way that's correct. By the time of her father's death, she was about 21 years old, already married and out of the house to Albert McLernan, who was an ice man. Wiley had a variety of jobs throughout his life. For several years, he worked for the Merchants Ice Company as a teamster. And then later, he worked as a motorman for the Springfield Traction Company, which was a streetcar company. He worked there for six years, but the bulk of his career had been as a law officer. He'd been a police officer for six years and a deputy for 18 months before his death. It's a really bad time of day to be by a headstone with the writing on this side. So I'm just gonna get kind of intimate here with Wiley Mashburn. Wiley is a character. He loved his job. He absolutely loved his job. He and Ollie Crosswhite had both worked for, um, for the city and the county as law enforcement officers. Occasionally they worked as agents for the railroad as well. And they both kind of liked to, I don't know if I want to say abuse, but they liked to kind of get physical with prisoners, maybe kind of to induce them to resist. In a more modern time, you know, these guys would have loved to have been like bounty hunters or something. In appearance, Wiley was basically the opposite of Ollie. Was stocky. He had blonde hair, blue eyes. He wore a tan Stetson that he pulled all the way down to his ears. He was cheerful. He was funny. But he had this tick. I guess you would call it a tick. He liked to hit people. <laughs> like as a, a sign of affection. Like, you know, coming up to your friend and be like, hey, hey, and hitting him in the shoulder or whatever is a sign of affection. But he did it so hard and so often that it really bothered some people. Years later, Frank Pike, who survived the massacre, would say, at one time he was paired up with White, with Wiley. And they were on patrol together and Frank was driving the car. And Wiley kept hitting him in the arm so hard and so often that it really started to make Frank mad. Frank said he pulled the car over, 
yanked Wiley out of the car, and I beat the crap out of him. Then we got back in, we drove back to the station, and I reported the whole incident of what Wiley had been hitting me, and I was sick of it. <laughs> but I guess he did that with everybody, and it meant he liked you. Oliver Rufus Crosswhite was born November 5th, 1889, the son of Nathaniel and Leela Crosswhite. He married Ethel Johnson on September 19th, 1911, and together they had quite a few children. When he died, his oldest child was 19, his name was Keith, then Henry, Carl, Ethel, Nellie, and Freddie, who was only two. Ollie changed jobs pretty frequently. In the 1920 census, he is working as an engineer in the light plant. In 1925, he's listed as a deputy sheriff. In the 1930 census, he is working as a watchman for the stockyard. Ollie was really good friends with Wiley Mashburn and they were both known a little bit for roughing up prisoners a little bit. The best story about Ollie I liked, first of all, he was described as a really big guy, really tall, 6'3", 6'4", with these massive hands. And one time when he was working as a railroad detective with Wiley, they got these group of kids from Brooklyn off the train who had been hiding. And Ollie slapped one of the kids across the back of the head saying hurry up or something like that and it really ticked the kid off and so he he said well then let's fight so Ollie said all right let's do it and so they made the little circle to have the the fight and the kid just mopped the floor with Ollie because he was a prize fighter in New York so I thought that was a pretty funny story and Wiley used to love to tell that story to everybody to embarrass Ollie. When Sheriff took office, he laid Ollie off and so Ollie and Ethel were in pretty dire financial need at the time of the, the massacre and Ollie ended up going along with them. So Sid Meadows, who died alongside Mashburn are buried side by side. He was originally from Chadwick, which is in Christian County, Missouri. He had moved to Springfield and worked on the north side for the Frisco Railroad and became a part of the police department around 1928 when he became a patrolman. And by the time of 1932, he was a member of the eight-man detective bureau. So Tony Oliver was his boss. Sid was described as a generous, kind, loyal man. He had just gotten married to a widow named Lily. Sid's brother and his niece did not even meet his wife, his new wife, until the day of the funeral. Sid was 47 in 1932, and luckily he had purchased a $1,000 life insurance policy from Mr. Durer, who I mentioned when I was at Tony's grave, which did go to his widow, Lily. She wrote a letter of appreciation to the company. I guess they used her in ads because she stressed the importance of having life insurance and how grateful she was that the policy existed for her to use. There is a, a story attached with Sid that appeared in the papers at the time. Uh, Leslie or Lucille Thompson was his niece and it was attributed to her. Her father's name was William and the story goes that two or three weeks before his death they were visiting they were visiting Sid and William said I dreamed that you got killed in the line of duty and that you had a bullet hole right in your forehead and she is quoted as saying well Uncle Sid just laughed and said, well, I don't believe in dreams. And then the story continues that when they went to see him at the funeral home, her father said, look, look, exactly where I dreamed it would be, a bullet hole right in his forehead. Years later, she absolutely denied that that ever happened. So it was probably just a story made up by the newspaper to sell more newspapers. Imagine that. I just found Charles Hauser. He was one of the youngest who was killed that day. 
He was 28 years old, and his neighbors described him as, quote, the best-natured youngster, always jolly and ready to do something for others, no matter how tired he was. Charlie Hauser's life had been pretty sad. When Charlie died, there was only one person left in his family, his little brother, Fred. But he had had three brothers. One had died in a motorcycle accident. Then he had lost his mother, his father, a brother, and his grandparents to the flu epidemic. And Charlie had also caught that, but did manage to survive. He had grown up in Joplin, Missouri, and after the death of his family, moved to Springfield. He worked for years as a bus driver and had been working as a police officer for about the last three. He started off as a motorcycle officer. In the 1931 newspapers, he is mentioned multiple times for people he had arrested. He helped quell a riot in the Greene County Jail. He rushed a little girl to the hospital who had been hit by a car. Sadly, that three-year-old little girl did not survive. He went out on raids. He was a very active member of the police force. He even attended a surprise birthday party held for Chief of Police Ed Waddell. Tony Oliver also went to this surprise birthday party. That was in February of 1931. He officially drove the paddy wagon and he was supposed to have been a very jovial, friendly guy. He was really popular with all the other police and with the public. The day of the massacre, that morning they had busted up some sort of liquor ring and he had all of these drunk people in the paddy wagon and he pulled up that day and said, hey, what do you want me to do with all these people? And they said, well, we're, we're pretty much full up with, uh, I forget what the guy said, gangsters or roughnecks or something. And I guess you can put them in the basement. <laughs> Charlie was married. His wife's name was Augusta. And she talked about their romance. She said, quote, I guess there never was a sweeter love affair than ours. He was a big, jolly fellow, you know, but about the most bashful you ever saw. It was killing the way he proposed to me, if you could call it proposing. We'd been going together about two years, since 1926. And one night, we were with some other kids, and somebody said something about getting married. I wouldn't get married, I bragged. Charlie came up to me and tipped up my chin and said, Wouldn't you? Fred lived with them for a little while after their parents died. He was still pretty young at that time. Then he got married and he and his wife also lived with them. His daughter was born there. But for whatever reason, after Charlie died, Fred went out of his way to prove that Charlie and Augusta had never been married. She was never able to definitively prove that they had indeed married in 1928. Therefore, she was denied any access to his estate, to widow's benefits, or to the fund that was raised by the city for the families of the lost officers. She seemed to be completely taken aback by what Fred was doing. She said, first of all, his estate's not worth much. All she really wanted was to keep the car that he had purchased for her. Anything else was very minimal. So why Fred did this to her, I don't understand. Certainly she didn't understand. It is so sad. She was forced to move out of their house pretty much immediately after he died. She took a room on Walnut Street. Eventually, she was a waitress for a barbecue stand at the corner of Grant Street and Walnut. What ultimately happened to her, nobody really knows. It's said she ended up in Chicago, that she married again, but when she died or any information like that is unknown. Harry and Jennings were in Texas, running one of the most sophisticated car theft rings in the country at the time. They would steal cars in Texas and bring them back to Missouri to sell them. And it's on one of these trips when they were tempted to visit Ma that these two groups are finally going to come together in such a fatal way. Marcel Hendricks 
was obsessed with catching Harry. Thus far in his career as a lawman, Harry was the only who he had not captured. And he wanted to remedy that and get that perfect record. In our next episode, these six men and the two young brothers profiled in episode one will have their fateful encounter. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you would like to financially support the channel, I am on Patreon at patreon.com slash madamorbid. Please share with your friends, watch the whole thing, like, subscribe, all of that stuff helps. I appreciate everybody who is supporting me, whether on Patreon or just stopping in to watch the whole thing and make a comment. I love having you here. Thank you so much for giving me your time. I will see you next time when we talk about a massacre.